This meeting is being recorded. All right, well, welcome everybody to the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources Spring 2023 webinar on open education and community impact. I'm really excited to have a couple of uh, a couple of presenters today who are going to be talking about some projects and experiences related to the ways in which open education can be understood to have an impact on the communities outside of the traditional classroom. Um, I would like to encourage everybody to in, uh, introduce yourselves in the chat, maybe just say uh, your name and what college you're from or what institution or organization you're affiliated with. Um, that'll give us a sense of who all's here. So I have a couple of, uh, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, we have the agenda. Um, we are going to be first kind of talking just very briefly about what CCC OER is, uh, just to, if you're not familiar, if you happen to not be a member. Um, and then, like I said, we have a couple of presentations and um, then there are a few other items towards the very end after a QA and a session um, that I'll address as well and give you the opportunity to understand kind of what's going on with CCC OER and OE Global. So, okay, can go to the next slide. So first of all, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources um, is a network of institutions, uh, primarily all community college institutions across North America who are dedicated to um, supporting faculty and supporting um, institutional initiatives with respect to open education. Um, the network uh, it provides an opportunity for practitioners of open education to engage in discussions and share projects and resources and also kind of ask questions and learn from each other because that's what um, this community is kind of all about is sharing and learning from each other and building off of what each other is capable of doing. So we're really happy to um, have been doing this work for a long time. Um, one of the things that we do is is we do these um, uh, uh, about eight webinars a year or so, um, but there are um, other kinds of projects that CCC OER is um, involved in, such as um, you know uh, the, the regional leaders for open education and um, other kinds of kind of focused. Uh, projects that that we've been doing over the years as well and of course all of that comes down to the, the main goal for all of us is to improve student success um, and equity. So um, now next slide. So yeah, this just gives you a visual sense of kind of where we're located. It's a pretty good spread across the United States and even um, up north in Canada there. Um, I'm uh, Matthew Bloom. Maybe I should have introduced myself first. I'm Matthew Bloom. I'm um, English faculty at Scottsdale Community College, and I'm on the executive council of CCC OER, focusing on professional development. And I'm based in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is in the Phoenix area. Um, so uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about me. And if you want to go to the next slide, I think we can go ahead and introduce our speakers. Now, unfortunately, one of our speakers had to um, had a conflict at the last moment was not able to make it. So we're only going to have two speakers today. Um, but I believe that we will have a great opportunity for discussion. As we're kind of going through these presentations, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat to express those. And, um, you know, I'll make note of them and then we can do a follow up Q&A afterwards. So I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Rebecca Vasquez Ortiz, who was a regional leader of Open Education Advisor. Uh, she was on she's on the ALSA board member um, and a she is a psychology professor at Santa Ana College. And then we also have Dr. Jamie A. Thomas, who is a linguistics professor at Santa Monica College uh, at CS, uh, Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, and an open for anti-racism coach. And um, I think that without further ado, I would love to just go ahead and pass this on first to Dr. Ortiz to have uh, to take some time to um, present to us some of her experiences and uh, thoughts about how open education impacts community beyond the classroom. Thank you, um, Matthew, and I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, first, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I, I, um, I'm always uh, interested in, in the work that um, we're doing in higher education around uh, OER and open pedagogy. So again, thank you. Um, and as Matthew said, um, I'm trained as a uh, developmental psychologist. And what that means for me, um, aside from my interest in um, social justice, is that uh, I, I, I'm kind of at the interface between quantitative and qualitative analysis. And um, I do a, a lot of other interesting work around methodologies. So super excited about that type of, of um, of involvement. And uh, I also want to give a quick shout out to um, the regional 
leaders of open um, education and and some of some of my colleagues who are here today. So um, thank you for coming, and uh, I, I hope to shed um, some more light on what it means to be uh, based around community building. And I wanted to honor that connection because I've done a lot of uh, work um, both in um, presentations and other um, spaces with with the Arlo team. Um, let's see. I, See if I wanted to share anything else about um, what uh, what I've been up to as of late, um, and uh, I I think that right. I wanted to start off by um, saying happy birthday to Dolores Huerta, who just turned ninety three a couple of days ago. And I wasn't um, speaking uh, that day, so I I just promised myself that the next time I had an audience and was holding a microphone, I would send a. a Happy birthday, um, shout out to Dolores Huerta, who has been so inspirational uh, to many women of color um, and, and people of color. And, uh, and with that, I wanted to share a quick quote that um, I found uh, um, recently about uh, from Dolores Huerta. And we have centered some of this in our work with Arlo in terms of understanding what leadership is. But I, today I wanted to give you a slightly longer quote um, because for me, it really connects to what it means to be centering community practices. So Dolores says, we just have to convince other people that they have power. This is what they can do by participating to make change, not only in their community, but many times in their own lives. Once they participate, they get their sense of power. And so for me, the work that Dolores Huerta has done around um, community activism and grassroots uh, empowerment really helps us as we enter these spaces around open pedagogy and take our leap from just examining what it means to be using open resources and actually creating power and movement in, in marginalized communities where we haven't seen that um, as we've seen historical oppression around power and resource hoarding. So I wanted to start with that. And I hope that um, if anybody has any comments or questions about that, I think Matt, Matthew said that you could put those in the chat and then we will also come back to that towards the end today. So first I wanted to start with that. And then I wanted to lead into the idea of about leading from the middle. And leading from the middle really allows us to interrogate power. Uh, the way that Dolores Huerta brings it up in her uh, work around empowerment. And so if we consider traditional hierarchy, we're looking at a top-down approach. And most of us are very familiar with this top-down approach because we've navigated higher education. And we know what it means to either be a leader or a follower and how we have to assume these different perspectives uh, in the different spaces that higher education has created, right? So for example, while we're still working on our tenure, we have to be more followers than leaders, right? Because if we take a position that is more leadership oriented and it doesn't necessarily jive with, let's say, our tenure committee, it could cause us problems, right? And then the day comes that we receive our tenure and now we realize, okay, well, we now are leaders because we have our tenure, so we can potentially move into this space of, of saying I'm ready to be a leader. And, and some of those transitions are particularly difficult for people like me who come from marginalized communities because it's not easy to shed that necessarily once we feel that it's our time to develop our leadership um, because of all of the historic experiences we've had and then learning to navigate that tenure process. So that's a quick example of saying, okay, this hierarchical structure is what we really have been indoctrinated into and trained as, as, as those of us who have navigated both our own education and now have become educators. Um, and, you know, in open pedagogy, we're asking you to challenge that. And we're asking you, which is not easy, right? Because we say, well, now we're, you know, now I am the professor, right? Now I should yield or wield the power. Um, and so there the idea becomes, a leader leading from the middle allows us to take steps both as leaders and followers throughout the different educational um, uh, spaces that we occupy and never traditionally give up full leadership or full um, following so that it's easier to navigate that as 
we come into spaces like this where we see, oh, others have more or less um, uh, resources or knowledge, let's say, than a particular person might have. So I wanted to center that first because um, when we look at community empowerment models, it's difficult to say, let's empower the community if we don't understand the way we're socialized to really follow a hierarchical model. model. And I also believe that Dolores Huerta and her work centering grassroots movements looks at leading from the middle. So that's the first point I wanted to bring up, the leading from the middle. And then um, I also wanted to transition into um, cultural wealth models. Right? And so I think the last time I spoke um, with CCC OER, uh, I started this discussion around looking at multiple outcomes and empowerment that didn't just center on the idea of affordable and accessible material. And um, this is based off of my interest in uh, cultural wealth models, because uh, what we find is that in particular communities, um, there's already a built-in kind of protective mechanism that is community-based. Uh, and that's in, in, um, in reference to communities of color who um, tend to hold at their core value and cultural value systems, this idea of interconnectedness or um, kind of building the group. And in some cases, we even have situations where that sense of real individuality is, is considered shameful, right? Or is considered too um, ego-based. And so it, it makes sense that we would be able to embrace a theory like the cultural wealth model that Yasuo puts, puts out and say, hey, this model could be really effective in helping to create content at higher education levels and also for dual enrollment students and K through 12 students that centers this idea of saying, hey, let's look within the community and let's look at all of the valuable resources that the community contains or the community capital, if we wanna think about an economics perspective. And we could say, we can build up additional pedagogy and other types of engagement strategies that center the idea of building trust, right? And so building trust says, we value your commitment to critical thinking. We value your commitment to higher education. And in valuing that, you bring in these assets, whether they're linguistic assets, because many times um, people of color are navigating multiple linguistic systems, uh, maybe um, social, right? Social um, assets. Again, we see through these extended networks of support that um, communities of color develop. Um, and then, um, of course, the idea of resistance, right? So what is it that we see students of color uh, or, and other marginalized groups who come to an educational setting and faculty and administrators and, and our staff of color, what do they bring to that setting that centers social justice through their experiences, right? And so many of these people who can potentially be brought in to lead from the middle, whether they're community members, students, right, family members, I, I, may, I was alluding to that last time, um, can, can quickly help us build a, a wider, more diverse understanding of what it means to be an intellectual by bringing in these types of resources that really already exist. And then, like I said, um, the building of trust means that once you pull these uh, assets in, then the idea of creating pedagogy and um, engaging students to create pedagogy is so much easier, right? And so um, I wanted to finish off, right, what I was speaking about today by saying that it's not easy. Uh, and it's not easy for me when I get challenged by my students, right, or my community. Um, but the idea that we could bring those who have already built, a, a, you know, a real um, um, set of skills that could be transferred and used within our curriculum and within our assessments uh, from the communities that we live in and that we work in really, I think, is a, is a great model for saying, how can we not just create these spaces, 
but how can we evaluate them in terms of the disproportionate impact that we see? And in particular, um, specific areas of study that tend to be the gatekeeping courses for advancing in higher education. So um, I look forward to questions and, uh, and other dialogue. Um, uh, and I think I'll pass the microphone now back to Matthew. Thank you, Rebecca, so much for um, for sharing all those thoughts with us and kind of centering this conversation on the the way in which we see ourselves as you know having some agency, but not necessarily you know going into the community as you know in a leadership role so much as as you said leading from the middle. And I think that that might in some ways help us address um, a question that I'll have later um, that, I, that I think I'll be asking has to do with the history of uh, the appropriation of knowledge and um, culture by per, per, like the dominant society and how there may be um, concerns in um, certain communities uh, when they're approached by people coming from the academy and, you know, with, with respect to, you know, asking them to participate in ways that are, maybe we would have to understand really how to package our, our communications um, and, and really make it clear that, that, you know, it's understood to be a, a collaborative generation of knowledge and a collaborative growth experience. But um, I don't want to um, go into that in too much detail right now because I'm not the expert and that's just what some of the thoughts I had based on what you said. So thank you so much. Um, what I'd love to do now is is transition to um, Dr. Jamie Thomas. So um, Dr. Thomas, if you would, um, uh, I believe you have some slides and, and uh, so go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Rebecca and to also uh, Matthew. Really appreciate um, the thoughts here, and what I'm going to try to do is build upon what uh, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Ortiz just shared with us about community engagement, trust building, and I'm going to add a third theme, which is democratizing knowledge. So um, I start from this premise um, through my involvement with the OFAR, or the Open for Anti-Racism Program, um, and I, I want to acknowledge that some of the um, participants in the program and leaders of the program are on the call today, so thank you all for everything you're doing. Um, sharing this slide from one of our previous uh, conversations on anti-racist pedagogy to talk about why this matters, right? To be race conscious, to be bold and brave through our content and our leadership in the classroom, using these opportunities to not only to inform ourselves as instructors, but to also encourage our students to see the implicit bias that frames their experiences in education and also their experiences beyond the classroom, to think systemically and structurally about how to expose and critique the ways that perceived differences and our uh, responses to those, our social responses to those, structure our relationships, um, and to also understand the foundations and history that guide what we do right now in the present moment through our fields and disciplines, understanding that uh, previous ideas about who gets to ask the questions, who gets to develop guidelines for legitimate knowledge, and who gets to have a voice, all govern what we consider to be, say, psychology or linguistics or even psycholinguistics today. And using uh, teaching, uh, uh, opportunities to include voices and perspectives from many different peoples and groups, particularly marginalized perspectives, particularly perspectives that have been left out of our disciplines, and to then invite students to contribute their own perspectives and experiences. This is all of what we're trying to do in framing and building out an anti-racist pedagogy. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide there. And in this slide, I just wanted to sort of share that as a result of our previous run of the OFAR program, the Open for Anti-Racism program, um, we found that, um, and this was through some of the uh, data gathering by the leaders of the program, that uh, overwhelmingly college administrators and faculty were finding this to be a very um, meaningful experience um, and that uh, the school that I worked with uh, in this last run of the program, Imperial Valley College, which is close to, to the California-Arizona border, that uh, 
the partnership between the faculty, and this was an interdisciplinary partnership. So we had psychology, history, English faculty, math faculty working together, together with their dean, that as the dean and the school responded to what they were learning and provided the faculty with time to share out uh, through on uh, in-service professional development on campus, that more of the campus was able to benefit from our learnings. So let's go to the next slide because I'd like to share with you um, just some of what students were learning from this process and then also what some of the faculty were saying themselves. And so students were saying, saying that they appreciated being able to examine the history of the discipline, that they were able to use classroom content to identify and challenge biases, and that they were able to personally identify with the content by seeing connections with their cultural and racial backgrounds. And all of this helped to make the learning experience more meaningful. So what are we talking about? Let's go to the next slide. And here I want to, uh, in just a moment, play uh, just a, a short video, about a minute, of uh, one of the uh, professors uh, in our uh, cohort talking about why she chose to use um, uh, an OpenStax uh, history OER textbook, um, what her experience was in working with students to examine that textbook and tailor parts of it so that it spoke more to Southwest uh, history and community engaged leaders. So let's go ahead and hear from uh, this professor. I have been using the OpenStax US history OER for a few years now. And we may go ahead and um, open to full screen for just a moment. It, had, it has good links in there. It's got audio visual materials and stuff in there. There are also ways for students to annotate material in there. And it was more inclusive than some of the traditional history textbooks had been. But I was noticing gaps. I just wasn't sure if what I was seeing is what mattered to students. And so my project, I took one of my sections of History 121, which is basically late 1870s to current. And for the students, first of all, a survey. What areas were they interested in? And that's when they came down to the women's movement, the Chicano movement, the black movement. Um, and so within that, those who had those similar areas of interest worked together and reviewed each of the chapters that pertain to those areas and said, okay, who is missing? What voices are we not hearing? What, who are we not reading about? When we include the voices of different groups, students have more of a relationship to the information. As Cynthia noted with her students, they see more of that connection. They see themselves. It makes it more relevant to them. It gives them more of a connection to their community as to where they're from and what they can do to make it better. And they see themselves as being able to change the narrative. Part of it was I had to stand back and let them go because they started looking at things and I, there was a tendency at one point for me to kind of want to rein them back in a little bit. And I had to say to myself, no, this is their area of interest. This is what they want to know. Trust their instincts, trust the library staff. And, and see what they come up with. And that was that was a hard part for me, but it was definitely worth the experience to do that. And some of what they came up with was extremely powerful. And I think sometimes we need to let the students tell us or show us what motivates them so we can make this a very a much more interactive process in their education. Thank you. Okay, so what you saw there was a history professor talking about her own journey alongside her students in opening up to open pedagogy and opening up to co-collaboration with her students, such that she was centering student concerns and um, being able to be responsive to uh, their particular interests. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Because here I want to share with you a project that um, I did with my students, and this was prior to me coming to Santa Monica College. I was teaching at Swarthmore College in uh, the greater Philadelphia area uh, for a number of years, and um, 
through this, uh, I taught a seminar on language and identity and the African experience and used that as an opportunity to talk about um, uh, diasporic experiences. So we talked about Latin America, we talked about the Caribbean, we talked about Mexico, um, and then we brought our learning locally. And so we looked into a um, Philadelphia-based Latinx community, and uh, I found a Puerto Rican community center. And we went to that community center, we listened in, we learned, and then the students said, you know what, we want to come back for their conference. They were having a, a conference based uh, or themed around Arturo Schomburg, um, a historical figure and um, historian, librarian uh, of great renown, and um, used it as an opportunity we did to gather interview uh, tape and uh, community um, thoughts and walk the neighborhood with folks. And then we incorporated that into a podcast which um, and website, which is available. And I'm going to go ahead and we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna put into the chat a link to the project. It's a bilingual project. And so it features English and Spanish. And um, I'm also gonna put a link to my website because there's more on the website um, with some of the other um, kind of co-constructed uh, uh, community engaged projects that I've done with students. And um, one of the things that I loved about this project though was that it brought out in personal words and experiences what identity is and what language is. And, um, and it about how to build trust with communities. It was the act of listening that did this for us. And I use this to teach a methodology, not only as a, as a critical pedagogy, but as a research methodology and put students in the driver's seat. So you see there that one of the students said that in learning about Afro-Latinx people, I've come to see identity categories as socio-racial constructs, not as um, indelible kind of givens, right? The community participant said, uh, about their experience, that they were battling it until at some point they realized I could be both Black and Dominican. So talking about all of these um, imposed um, identities or marginalizations and how that in, uh, uh, surfaces through language, that's part of what I'm interested in as a linguist too. So let's go to the next slide. So in developing this, I ended up developing a community engaged pedagogy of applied linguistics, which is what um, I'm so interested in, and thinking about how do we get students to make the questions? How do we get students and, partici and community participants to do the creative um, self-reflection in a way that pushes back against epistemological racism or this idea that even the sources we use to base our understanding on within our discipline can be framed by racist ideals. The idea that I wouldn't use, say, oral histories as a source because I don't value that source material, um, or I wouldn't um, uh, include in my bibliography uh, Black and Latinx authors. We uh, dispense with all of those things and centered these concerns as part of our endeavor to understand uh, ourselves through our interaction with others. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, what I chose to do was to um, include this podcast project as part of the way the seminar or the course was structured. So I included it in my syllabus, even though I wasn't sure how it would turn out or, or fully be structured, but I came up with a plan. So let's go to the next slide and you can sort of see how I attempted to do that. Um, I listed it as part of the syllabus. I gave it um, some sort of percentage of the grade and I encouraged students from the very beginning of the course to think about how they would pull together, work together to create an audio story. And I told them at the beginning that, okay, we don't know what this is going to come out like, but we're going to figure it out together. And that automatically put them in the position of having to think creatively and, and excitedly, I think, about what their contribution could be. Okay, so let's go to the next one. 
And so here is a, a view of the cultural center uh, in Philadelphia. And if you're located near Philadelphia, I encourage you to visit Taller Puerto Riqueño because it's a beautiful location um, towards the north side and um, also includes an art gallery, which is fantastic. Let's go to the next slide. And so we had a, a class field trip and then students returned on their own time to visit the conference and audio record interviews. And so a couple of the questions though that I'm thinking about now uh, uh, is how do I scale this type of project for larger class sizes? And how do I provide greater student agency with data gathering and storytelling? I'm um, enacting a, a new podcast project sort of based off of uh, the guidelines I came up with in this previous project. And this one uh, has students going to different locations based upon where uh, they are located, their neighborhoods or their local mall, and investigating in those ways. And that way, um, since I'm not at a residential campus, I can have students uh, sort of uh, do data gathering um, at the times in which that fit their own schedule. So let's go to the next slide. And so part of the work that went into this project was collaborating with digital humanities librarians and um, to do some of the website design and also have uh, conversations in class about what it means to democratize access to scholarly knowledge, um, access to community knowledge. And that was a really fascinating conversation for me too. Um, we learned about how to use some web tools so that students could um, gather the uh, audio and put it in a format where it could be on the website and played. Um, so students were really in the driver's seat for much of this. Um, there's a question from Theodore in the chat. How do you make sure that disabled students can participate in collaborative experiences like the podcast? This is a great question and it's one that I'm continuing to think about. Um, I'm about to have a conversation with my students uh, later today, actually, because I teach in the evenings. And we're gonna talk about what role they each wanna play in seeing this project through. And I wanna allow them to decide where they think they can be most valuable to the team. Um, and I think uh, a conversation like that would be really helpful because it can play to the students' strengths they can choose the role they want to play and how they can use their strengths and talents to support uh, others on the team. And um, that's also why I think it's good to embark on this project a little bit after you've already started the semester or you're more than halfway through because students will have had a chance to build community in and among themselves, get to see what their strengths are, um, and build upon that uh, as part of the team. So I've done a lot of team building, a lot of community building inside the class all along the way in order to try to enable um, some of this. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And so here's a view of us walking um, the neighborhood with some of the local murals. And you can see that this one is kind of dedicated to Taller Puerto Riqueño. There's, um, something on, on the uh, mural there in the center that says Centro de Educación or Central uh, Center of Education, Boricua, which is a word that refers to Puerto Rican identity. And I think it was really special for these students to connect with this location and this community, particularly because um, in this group, I didn't have any students that identified as Latinx or Spanish speaking. And so they were connecting with a neighborhood that's there, that's been there for uh, decades and that they didn't know about. So it was kind of like a hidden gem in a way. And what we wanted to do was make sure that we came in with a posture that was very much about learning from rather than dictating to. And I think that had a lot to do with folks being interested in talking with us um, and opening up with us for this project. And we also let them know in advance that this project was about sharing what we learned, not holding on to it and publishing it in a, like an obscure location. That was the purpose of putting this all online. Let's go to the next one. And so here's a view of how the website turned out. I really encourage you to check it out. Um, the end 
point was a repository of three podcast episodes where the students are narrating or talking. And I let them decide if they were going to do a sort of a scripted audio story or if they were going to do a discussion. Um, they decided on that. As we went along in the semester, what I put on the syllabus were different kinds of podcasts that we could listen to and decide how we felt about the storytelling. Um, and so the students came up with this format and I'm really amazed at what they created. Um, sometimes, uh, just like the history professor was telling us in that clip, when you put students in the driver's seat and you try to equip them with um, tools and experience and secondary sources, there's a lot that they can do. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Here's another view of part of the website. And so what we have is the podcast episode. And what we did was we uh, uploaded it to uh, SoundCloud. And then SoundCloud is like a website with, that is kind of like a YouTube, but for audio. And so then we were able to just embed our audio from SoundCloud onto this web uh, page. And we pre produced a little summary. We added some guiding questions. We added some sort of places and up to see that go along with the audio story. And then we added um, key terms. And so let's go to that next uh, page there. A little bit of context that derived from the things that we read in, in the course. And then the next page. And here's a view of where we're having um, sections of the, the page kind of talking about a certain issue or a key term and then playing some audio that or taking an audio clip that talks about that key term or that concept and having that accessible as you reach the um, read the key term as well. So um, this was a format that we learned that we could do in collaboration with the digital humanities librarians. And so shout out to all the librarians because y'all know your stuff, okay? But this is just an example of what can happen when we open up two different possibilities. And the way that I structured that last month of the course was to make my class time collaboration time. So we had our uh, in-class time with the librarians. We used campus resources like the computer lab. And we were actually in the computer lab during the last few class meetings. So um, that means that I had to kind of turn my um, class upside down and make it into um, applied time for the project. Um, Theodore is asking if there's transcripts of the, the podcast available. Um, insofar as we have um, kind of transcribed certain quotes and things on the website, I don't think we have full transcripts available, but that that should, I'm actually going to write that down because that should be um, our next step, um, the next iteration, at the project that I'm trying to uh, uh, complete this semester with students. And so I'm not going to tell you it's not a lot of work. That would be a lie, but it is very enjoyable work. And to see students really come into their own and make project decisions, I think is very exciting because it gives you the sense that if they go off on their own later after your course, they have an idea of how they can meaningfully engage with communities and create something. Let's go to the next one because I think that just about does it for me. Yep. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. That's very inspiring. There's quite a bit of activity in the chat. I think that um, if you've probably been look, reading some of the comments there, so um, I do appreciate you coming and sharing that um, project, really getting students out there and, and giving them the opportunity to explore their their local areas and, and see how, you know, they how they fit into the things around them, you know, so that's really great. Um, well, for everyone here, I'm actually like super excited to say that our third presenter is here and is a, was able to make it. So um, I would like to introduce Dr. Keith Anderson, who is faculty in English, Humanities, Creative Writing and Game Studies at Mesa Community College. And that's here in the Phoenix area. He's uh, one of the, he's faculty in the Maricopa Community College, College District, just like I am. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Keith so he can discuss a little bit about his uh, project and experiences. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Um, see, I'm getting rid of the chat is right in the middle of my screen. 
So I apologize for my late arrival. I, I was getting all these notifications about new Zoom logins because Mesa has decided to become a Zoom centric campus and I got them confused with the notifications for, for this meeting and um, so but I figured it out and I'm glad to be here and I'm pretty excited to tell you about some of the stuff I'm working on here. Now, so I'm in Mesa Community College, which is part of the larger Maricopa Community Colleges District. And um, a, the OER project that I, I worked on related to disability studies, which is a humanities class that I teach. And uh, the, the class focuses on representation in, across media and the idea of who's doing the representing, why, how, and, and so on. And then um, we overlay that with a study of the various models and approaches to the study of disabilities. So we go from a moral model, which uh, though it originated in ancient times as an explanation for disability based on metaphysical forces such as curses and blessings and, and so forth. Um, it's, even though it's a very ancient model, it's still very much alive and well with us. Uh, anytime someone says you deserve, you know, that person deserved to be um, hurt in some way, then they're using, they're, they're invoking the moral model to this, this point through their language. Um, the second thing we look at is the, um, uh, then the medical model, which is basically uh, finding the disability in the individual and then um, fixing that individual uh, through prosthetics or through uh, whatever means the medical um, community offers. Problem there oftentimes is the medical community presumes what is best for the patient and it met its uh, worst expression in the um, proliferation of eugenics around the turn of the century. And ultimately the disability played a, a role in the final solution because it was the people with disabilities who were first targeted. And then the social model, um, which is basically a person is disabled by his or her or their environment and, and not in their body. So it's our failure as a society to provide means of access that, that causes um, disability. It's not the person is using a wheelchair. It's the fact that we haven't built a ramp for that person. And so that's the social model. The activist model beyond that is uh, just when uh, people with disability began to speak for themselves and represent themselves and, and are truly empowered and don't rely so much on allies to uh, speak on their behalf and, and you know, support their cause, but they are able to uh, forcefully and righteously um, you know, pursue their, their own rights. Um, so that's kind of the, the background of, of what this project is a part of. So the, the students, you know, I have them look at uh, a variety of films and um, I'm not sure if I can play a film at this point, but um, we, we start with an article about um, basically there's an argument made that, that exceptions should be made even by people opposed to abortion, exceptions should be made for children who are uh, severely quote, deformed in some way or another. And, um, and, you know, the argument is made that parents should be able to choose to have an abortion in those cases, but not with a baby that exhibits no disabilities. And so then that gets us into thinking, you know, asking, well, what is, what is, how do we value life? How do we determine who has the right to live? Um, you know, who, quality of life, uh, those kind of things, who has choices over someone else? And Ultimately, we try to work towards um, uh, a, a disability advocacy um, you know, where, where rights are, are maximized. Um, so I, I start with a, um, and an, another thing I start them with is, I don't know if any of you've seen this yet, and I don't know if I can play, um, but this is a brilliant um, video Oh, I need to share screens now. Okay. Yeah, you should share <laughs> screen and make sure you click the share sound button. Okay. And now, would I be able to play a video with that or not? Yeah. If you're going to play a video, you just need to make sure you click the sound button. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear it. Okay. 
So moving to share screen then, and then the sound button, yeah, it's down there, share sound. Uh, do I need to optimize? Uh, I didn't when I played the video earlier, so. Okay. So, um, let me see that got to full screen. That's not the one I wanted to open to right now. Uh, let's see, new share. I wonder why it shows that particular screen to share. Let me go back to my, because this is where I'm trying to be. So now let's, can you see that screen now, or is it just the, the presentation? We're seeing a YouTube wi window. Okay, all right, that's, that's what I wanted to see. So I don't know if any of you have seen this, it's just a short 22 minute clip, um, but it, it touches on a lot of, of things that, um, um, you know, such as caretaking. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just show you the, the first couple of minutes of it, or maybe just a minute. Um, brilliant work by this screenwriter. Um, Stuart? Hey, Stuart. So Stuart's caretaker, regular caretaker, has quit. He found this person who, um, off of um, a, a social website, you know, just recruited him. Turns out he's a pretty good bot and good guy, but it kind of opens the students up to the idea of how vulnerable and exposed um, people with disabilities can be and, and you know, how how often there, how much abuse goes on in, in our society and, and disrespect. Um, and so he's in a situation there. Um, and I wanted to take it though, hey, good morning. farther ahead to um, this point here, my chair? where it, it's, it's very ironic because uh, the, the um, steward is using, um, he's listening to a sort of motivational speaker and then juxtaposed to the reality of, of how he's navigating the world and what that world is like um, is, is very ironic. So. Welcome to Spirituality for Aspiring CEOs and Entrepreneurs. Episode 43, Meditation for Ultimate Self-Sufficiency. Begin in a comfortable position. Allow yourself to feel gratitude for the fact that you are a seeker. You have chosen to pursue enlightenment and absolute liberation. The external world cannot affect or disturb you. You alone manifest your reality. The external world cannot affect or disturb you. No matter what you are experiencing, you can always will tranquility into being. As we begin the first exercise of the day, visualize what you desire with absolute clarity. Now. So as you can see, uh, it's it's meant to be funny and suits are uncomfortable um, with that, but the director is intending you to, to laugh because this is the director and he, his situation. And, uh, um, and life can be kind of funny and life can be cruel. And so there's elements of, of both of these things uh, running throughout the, the film. So I use that as a kind of, a, um, I, I ask students to analyze situations and try to put themselves in the, the shoes of, of someone else and um, who's living and perceiving and experiencing life very differently from you. And this, you know, of course, expands just beyond disability, but it, it, it you know, to different uh, language families, uh, linguistic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, class, all of these things are, are facets of the way we see and experience the world. And disability is, is um, one, and it is the minority to which we may all one day, which we all will one day or another join. So after kind of taking students through a variety of, of texts and so forth, 
then I um, have them do a field research where they go out and armed with um, some material about ADA policies and uh, practices and, and uh, ways to assess um, the accessibility of, of buildings. I, I have them go out and, and reconsider the places that they go. So I wanna go to the, uh, let's see, where is it now? That's not it. There's a, a let's see, this thing at the top is in my way. How do I move that, make that disappear? You should just be able to drag it somewhere else. Oh, okay. So the, the, ah, there we go. So we want to get to the activity itself, which is, so is it, there's a pursuit. Oh, okay. So th this is, um, so I, I have them do, um, an assessment, obviously, the, the first image here is, is showing that clearly places that um, brand themselves as accessible um, are clueless as to what that actually means. And um, get them to thinking about, I'm going to scroll through this, uh, how that we, we grow up assuming that the ADA has covered things and, and actually many laws um, need to need further reform and uh, including civil rights legislation, Native Americans are, are um, I assumed growing up as a child that they'd all been given land, you know, in the South, there were no reservations to reference. And when I was growing up, there's no internet. And so relying on local resources, I had no idea that, you know, they, they actually many times weren't granted the land, but was held in trust by the United States. And they weren't receiving that paycheck every month to compensate them for all the land that was stolen. So, um, Similar thing, we assume that the ADA is working, it's in place, and that there's no other issues. But then, and, and notice I just said disability was left out of this. Um, one of the groups is left out of the, um, a, a sign that was meant to show solidarity and sensitivity, still uh, inadvertently excluded uh, people with disabilities. Um, and then a lot of my students who take the disability studies class, because it's recommended as a, um, a humanities class for anyone in allied health and it's on the um, the pathways to uh, guided pathways to success it's one of the recommended courses so a lot of my students end up being in in one of those fields like nursing or or um you know diet or or you know in the allied health uh, there's massage uh, school certifications and so forth uh, and and to be because they'll be a, encountering people with disabilities more often than not, then they should be especially mindful of you know, disability etiquette and um, you know just awareness and, and observation. The caretaker who was just hired in the video, by the way, turns out to be the absolute best person, even though he didn't have any training. He's intuitive and asks the right questions. He listens and does all the things that I, I hope uh, caretakers after this class are, are more mindful of that. So um, I, I basically have them go through and um, think about, you know, what accommodations are needed and then remind them that there are exemptions and exceptions. And so a lot of the places that they frequent are not actually handicapped accessible. And that goes back to, there was a, a, the ugly laws in the United States. Uh, the last one was a repealed in 1974, I think in Chicago, Illinois, um, whereby the people with disabilities who were disfigured in any way um, were, were not allowed to circulate in public. And we still have holdovers that there's a home rule with insurance. For instance, the, the wheelchair or the electric power chair, let's say, that your insurance will pay for, uh, is not made except for in-home use. And so even the tool that's supposed to give um, people with disabilities access to the outside world is not really designed to give them that kind of access. So it's kind of a holdover of the, the ugly laws. And uh, um, my point is in that is, is that, um, you know, the world is 
not as accessible as it's touted to be um, by people who you know, invoke the ADA. Talk about um, unintentional uh, discrimination. Dr. Yes. Anderson. Dr. Anderson, yeah. I kind of have to jump in because we're right here at the end, and I just okay. wanted to, um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because this this project where you have students going out into the community and and you know identifying uh, places where. Um, you know, where persons with disabilities are, you know, are, are, are seeing the world and are experiencing the world in a very different way and, and trying to make them, uh, make the students kind of like giving them the opportunity to be agents to change that, um, I think is a really great example of this kind of like an open pedagogical approach. I appreciate your um, sharing this project with us today. Um, and I did want to go ahead and if you could unshare your screen, we've got a couple of like final, like last little slides that I kind of got to run through because um, of I know that a lot of folks have to log off right here in about a minute, um, but okay. I just wanted to remind everybody um, that we do have an upcoming webinar. It is uh, May 12th, or actually, which, which is, can we get that slide up maybe? Um, yes. Oh, yeah. First of all, so yes, please, if you're interested in joining the Executive Council of CCC OER, you have the opportunity as long as you're, you know, an institutional member. Um, it's a great, it's a great chance to uh, take part in like a professional development opportunities like this, like in putting them together, but then also with strategic planning and with other kinds of projects that we do. So um, if you're interested in that, there's information about the different roles uh, in that link there, and then you can nominate yourself or, hey, you might, might even like volunteer somebody else to do it right um and then next slide please um yes and then here we have a um uh, this right here is May 10th. Sorry, I said May 12th. May 10th is our last spring 2023 webinar. Um, and as you can see, it's about the transformative power of OER and ZTC pathways, and you can register there. Um, and then I think the final thing that I got to tell everybody about is get excited because OE Global 2023, the kind of the global open education conference is going to be in Edmonton here in North America up there uh, in Canada. So um, please uh, consider uh, sending up a sending a proposal in because the call for proposals closes on may 15th all right well i got at 1 p.m we're right at the hour thank you all for participating i am honored to have been serving on this uh, professional development committee with cccoer for five years and this is actually my last webinar with cccoer so maybe i'll see you as a participant one of these days but it's been a great uh, experience so thank you all for being here thank you to the presenters and uh thanks to cccoer for all the work that that you do and bye have a great day